Um, so this is just about the development of a, a national HWC strategy for national parks only in, in Canada. Uh, and I apologize, I have to look over here at my notes a little bit. I thought it would be up here, so I'd be back and forth a little bit. Um, just to give you a, a bit of context here with Canada, we're a very uh, large country, as many people uh, would know. We're actually the second largest country in the world. Um, neat fact, you can fit the UK inside Canada 40 times over. Um, and uh, about 40% of our land mass is up in the Arctic, in the, in the global uh, circumpolar uh, region, and that's very lightly inhabited up there. There's only about 200,000 people that live in there out of 39 and a half million for the whole country, and about 100,000 of those are Indigenous uh, people. And I'll talk a little bit more about Indigenous people later on, but we have 630 First Nations communities across Canada which represent 50 different First Nations and 50 different languages that they, they speak. And, and we, we'd like to acknowledge that they've been living in, in a good state of wildlife coexistence uh, for, for uh, thousands of years uh, in our country. Um, this is, the, the, the pink is all the protected areas in Canada. That includes the federal parks, all the provincial and territorial parks. And when we look at the uh, green areas on this map, these are the ones that are just under Parks Canada control, the federal jurisdiction Parks Canada Agency. And that includes uh, 48 national parks and reserves, 171 national historic sites. Uh, we have five national marine conservation areas and one new national urban park in our largest uh, city um, in the country. And our system is expanding, particularly as we uh, move towards our commitments to protect 30% by 2030. Um, our system is expanding and particularly we're going to see a great expansion with our, our national urban parks. Um, this spot here that I've circled in red is the, the Rocky Mountain National Parks of Canada, which is probably uh, the spot that people are most used to thinking about in, in Canada. And we'll show some pictures of that in a second. Um, but they, they are the, the, the busiest. So our, our park system varies from some of these big parks in the Arctic see almost no visitation whatsoever. Uh, whereas in our Rocky Mountain areas, we have bustling town sites in, in the parks and we see up to 5 million visitors a year. Um, so that's an example, that's a picture of uh, Banff National Park and as I say, very, very high levels of visitation. And in fact, when we graph that out and look at our overall human wildlife conflict incidents uh, mapped against visitation, we see a very, very strong correlation with the exception of the COVID year, which was a, a weird little dip in the graph for us. Um, so there's, there's an example of a lot of the conflicts we have to deal with in those busy uh, mountain parks that are preventing us from getting into a state of coexistence because there is uh, just such high levels of visitation. Uh, impacting the, the charismatic wildlife species that we have there. So we'd, we'd like to get ourselves to a point where we have uh, a lot better examples of coexistence either through you know direct human use management for the, the visitation or some of our applied mitigations. We have a very uh, a comprehensive network of wildlife crossing structures over our, our major highways or, or freeways as people might call them. Um, and they've been extremely successful in, in reducing uh, vehicle collisions with, with wildlife. So, um, we, you know, we feel quite strongly that our protected places in, in Parks Canada really should be models of, of human wildlife coexistence. If we can't do it in our national parks, where can we do it? And that's the vision that we're working uh, towards, is one where all our protected places are, are, are shared landscapes where people and wildlife can successfully coexist. Um, so the big question, I guess, is you know why do we need a, uh, a national strategy for, for human wildlife uh, coexistence? And um, we, we've outlined, as I say, a, a vision and the, you know the various priorities and actions and a, and a roadmap uh, for it. But what we haven't had in national parks is a coordinated national approach to managing human wildlife conflicts. Uh, across the country. So we've allowed each individual national park to manage them themselves and that's very different from how we uh, approach our search and rescue operations or our forest fire management in the national parks. So we're just trying to have a more coordinated vision that would allow us to progress 
uh, better and, and achieve a better state of coexistence. So you can see there we've got uh, our, our four main goals that we've uh, mapped out uh, within our strategy uh, leading to our, our four key targets which are uh, wildlife safety and well-being, uh, public safety and enjoyment for our visitors, obviously the staff safety and that they have the proper support that they need to do their work, and then credibility of our agency in minimizing liability. And then we've got um, six different objectives where we see areas of vulnerability within our agency that we'd like to improve on. Um, and, and stemming from them, uh, we've, we've got some outcomes that we're, we're hoping for as well. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this capacity and preparedness piece of the objective in, in just one second. So uh, we did establish a, um, uh, an HWC community of practice um, as we've developed this strategy and it's comprised of a, a number of external partners and then also uh, a variety of internal functions within, uh, within the Parks Canada Agency. And we've convened a variety of task teams on an as-needed basis and a really good example of that is within our communications group, we developed a national uh, human wildlife coexistence communication strategy that was rolled out across uh, the entire country in the last year. So in terms of the scope of uh, this particular strategy, that was one of the key questions that was, you know, we had to sort of grapple with at the outset is, is uh, you know, what would be, would be covered? And, and it is all the species of wildlife that are protected under our Canada National Parks Act and our regulations. So it's not just, you know, these charismatic megafauna species, but it's all the little species, uh, you know, right down to, uh, invertebrates and, and, and all that sort of thing. Um, and it is all the lands and waters and ice that are administered by uh, Parks Canada. Now, I will offer a little bit of a caveat there that the attention to these different species, even though all of them are within the scope, we will scale that in proportion to the risks. And when I say the risks, not just the risk to human safety, um, which I'll talk specifically about in a second here, but also the risks to uh, ecosystems and, and ecological integrity. So, uh, you know, the most significant risks that we would have, obviously, would be uh, wildlife attacks on visitors. Um, and those are, thankfully, uh, very rare. Uh, but as everybody knows, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about, uh, you know, tigers in India or bears in Canada, uh, when these incidents do happen, um, they, they generate uh, significant international media interest. Um, I did a quick crunch of the numbers the other day and looking at our overall visitation, we have about one bear contact of a visitor for every 13.3 million visitors that we have to our national parks. So it's exceptionally rare, but very high profile when it does happen. As I mentioned, bears, uh, uh, they are the most commonly involved species in, in attacks. We have uh, these three species of bears in uh, Canada's national parks. That's the American black bear on the left that's on the tent. This is the known globally as the, ground, the brown bear. We refer to it as a grizzly bear in uh, North America. And then we have polar bears as well in our, in our northern sites. Um, we've had uh, other carnivore species that have been involved in fatal attacks on visitors, cougars or mountain lions have, uh, have killed uh, people before, as have uh, coyotes. Um, and then we've had attacks by wolves that have not resulted in fatalities of visitors, but have resulted in serious injuries. And then finally, we also have ungulate species that do present concerns and, and occasionally attack. Uh, visitors, and that's primarily during the spring birthing season, when they're giving birth to their, their calves and fawns, um, and then again in the fall during the breeding season. So in terms of our, uh, our, our, our training, we've got um, very comprehensive uh, protocols in place um, that allows our, our staff to respond efficiently uh, and prevent further wildlife attack incidents. Uh, and we train um, internationally with people. We've developed some great wildlife safety communications to uh, mitigate and prevent uh, attacks from happening. 
And you know, beyond the ones that are uh, for wildlife safety, we've also expanded our communication to a number of our other challenges that we have in terms of feeding wildlife, uh, uh, wildlife mortality on the roads, and also uh, just crowding wildlife and not giving them enough space. We've got a really strong incident uh, data collection system internally within Parks Canada. Um, and we've created uh, this dashboard system here for the output of data, which allows our staff to very uh, quickly and efficiently monitor trends over time. And that's something that we've been working on uh, quite a bit in recent years. And we've got a, a commitment to making sure that all that data is, is posted on the open government portal. Um, so that we're completely transparent with everything that's happening in our park system and we're putting more and more onto the open data portal all the time. And just uh, finishing off here, um, I mentioned earlier that uh, in Indigenous people have coexisted with wildlife across Canada for thousands of, of, of years. Um, and, and we're certainly hoping that the, the um, human wildlife coexistence activities that we undertake in, uh, in our national park system will help work towards stronger reconciliation with Indigenous partners. Um, we, we do have a number of uh, sites that are co-managed with Indigenous nations and we'll have more of those in the future. Um, and this is just a diagram of something that, uh, that we always try and think about when we're uh, moving forward with different strategies and things like this. We have our our standard Western knowledge systems that we're all used to from a science perspective. And that's very different from the traditional indigenous knowledge systems. And so we like to think about those circles uh, coming together in what we call the ethical space or two-eyed scene as we uh, move forward. And that's a, a real guiding principle for us as we develop this strategy. Um, so that's, that's it for me and would be happy to have anybody reach out to myself or my colleague David who couldn't uh, make it here to ask us questions about this uh, in the future. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for the interesting talk. We showed a picture of four people in the forest with <coughs> guns, yeah? Uh, yeah. These, um, out for, you know, is it to, uh, what exactly are you doing? Are you shooting the, the bear or whatever, or is it to tear it, I don't know. So that was, that was a picture I, I took just during a training session, but that would be a, a, a training situation where we'd be responding to a wildlife attack, in that case, a bear attack. And so if we, if we go into a situation like that where a bear has seriously hurt or potentially killed a visitor, everybody is fully armed um, because there's a strong likelihood we may have to, to kill the bear or, you know, defend ourselves. So that's the, just one of the training exercises that we do. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, when you're looking forward to co-management and having this uh, vision or incorporating other ways of dealing with conflict, do you have any examples of how do you think, uh, or you know that the indigenous community approach conflict? Are they, do you expect to have new ways to reduce conflict once you move into that more? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's that, that's a, a, a great question, and I, I don't want to answer it with a five-second soundbite. So what I'm going to say is come and and chat with me after. But I've got a colleague here who is working on a project called Wild About Wolves, and it, it completely incorporates all the indigenous perspectives into that project. And I'll connect you up with him, and you guys can talk quite a bit. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Thank you very much.